hello and welcome to the art of being human. You know, I'm always saying if you need help, get it. There's no crime in needing help and there's no crime in getting help. But a lot of people feel they have to be on top of everything, which they can't be, of course. So case in point, what happens if you don't get the help that you need when you need it? Well, I've alluded to it in other shows. The problems pile up and they raise their heads to haunt you. For example, I've mentioned before that every stage of development has a challenge within it or more than one challenge within it and if you don't resolve the challenges at the time that you have them then when the next challenge comes it piles itself on top of the old one but the old one isn't finished letting us know that it's there and you can get into some very very complicated issues now I won't going to start and talk about OCD obsessive compulsive disorders and that's a good example of what happens to you when you have a problem and the problem is not resolved. Obsessive compulsive disorder is a type of mental disorder in which you have unwanted Un, uh, uh, unasked for thoughts, difficult thoughts, unhealthy thoughts, and your body wants to get rid of them. But instead of getting rid of them, you don't know what to do with them. So your body's response is to create behaviors to hopefully stop them from coming or stop them from bothering you. And that's where the compulsions come in. The compulsions come in as different types of behavior to control the obsessive thoughts that you're having. The obsessive thoughts could be anything, but they're there and you can't control them and they come back and they're intrusive. An intrusive thought is a thought that just doesn't go away. You're always bombarded with it. Supposing you're a person who has some kind of a problem with stealing. All the time you're thinking about stealing. No, I'm not going to steal. I can't steal. This is a behavior I don't want. And you're thinking about it. Your mind is being flooded with, with thoughts about stealing. So what do you do? Your body's going to create a certain sequence of behavior. A lot of it is ritualistic behavior to try to control that obsessive thought about stealing. Now stealing is just one example and it's probably not the best example, but there are all kinds of examples that I could use. It wouldn't matter. The body is going to try to stop it or control it through some kind of ritualistic behavior to stop Stop the thought. So what kind of ritualistic behavior can we have? Well, hand washing is one. Supposing a person's been involved with something that's not healthy, not emotionally healthy, not physically he healthy at all, and it might even involve sexual behavior. How to get rid of it? Wash your hands of it. Just wash your hands of it. So every minute or two, they're washing their hands. Their hands are raw because they've washed them too much, but they have have to do it because that's the way they control the thought that's behind it. They may not even be aware of what the thought is. But, you know, we all do some obsessive things. For example, uh, how many times do you have to check the door to your apartment when you leave it to make sure it's off so you can go downstairs and take it and uh, do whatever you want to do for the day? How many times do you have to check the stove to see if it's really off? Because if it's on, then maybe you could have a fire and somebody down the hall may be cooking something. What, is that my stove? Did I turn it off? Up you go, checking the stove. Yes, it's off. I've known people to, st to check their stove at once after another, after another, after another, sequentially for an hour or so at a time. I check my stove, it's off. I go in the other room, but what if it isn't really off? What if it's something? Maybe there's something there. And you go back and you check it. Yes, it's off. Well, well, you go back in the living room, you sit down, you're watching television. Did I really turn off the stove? And you go back to it. Well, pity the poor person who's going to work and they have to be there by a certain time every morning. And that would be fine if they didn't have to spend a half an hour checking to see if their apartment door was locked before they left for work. They have to accommodate that. Or supposing you're a person that you have to button your sweater or button your jacket in a certain order and you don't do it. For some reason you skip a button. Well, that's a calamity.
ready. You have to go back and undress and then redress yourself and, and uh, button that sweater all over again. But if you miss it, one little thing is off. It's like the world is coming to an end and you have to go back and you do it over and over and over again because you're never satisfied because it could be better and so forth. And it, it uh, is a kind of behavior that if it's mild, you can put up with it. If it's extreme, then it can be so debilitating that you can't even work. A person who needs to take a shower every day, well, there's certainly not any problem with that. But supposing a half an hour after you have taken the shower, you can't remember that you washed a certain part of your body, or did you get enough soap on a certain part of your body back in the shower again? And you get dressed and you're all set to go, and wait a minute, did I wash my hair? Did I take my pills? I can't remember if I did this or I did that. So back and you repeat yourself over and over and over again. It can be terribly, terribly debilitating. Or it can be mild and it's not a problem. Most people have a little bit of trouble with it and that's not a problem. But when it's debilitating, it can it cost you so much time and so much money that, that you can't work, you can't function. Now I wanted to mention particularly about hoarding. Hoarding can be a type of obsessive compulsive behavior and it goes over a period of time. You're hoarding something, you don't want to throw it away. What if you have need of it? Now you might not have need of it until four or five months down the line. You may never have need of it again, but just in case you ever need it, you'll have it so you keep it. Now the world of hoarders is a terrible world because they have all kinds of stuff rotting in their refrigerator that they might want to eat at some time, even though they probably never will because now it's moldy. You know, uh, how do they know that that half a hanger that should be thrown away because they'll never use it might at some point become just a little bit important because maybe you'll have need of it. What will happen if their worlds are full of what ifs? What if I need this and I toss it out and I need it later on and I wished I had it back? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if the house goes up in flames because I forgot to make sure that the stove was off that one incredible time? I mean, I checked. 40 times, who knows, maybe on the 41st time, I'll find something that I didn't do that I have to correct in order to keep me safe. And you see, this is a never ending problem. It just increases and increases and increases. Well, I saw a program on television uh, about a hoarder, and I think it's a perfect example of getting help when you need it and what happens if you don't. This is the educator, this is a true story. I'm, I do a lot of educating, I've been a teacher for years, and so I was interested in this story from that aspect. This is a man who loved his job. He was a teacher, he was an educator, he was a superintendent, he absolutely loved his job. Everything that was important to him was in that job, and he was good with it, and the job was right for him. And he broke up a, a high school drug ring somehow and stopped the kids from using drugs. The kids were upset because they were no longer able to have their little drug ring in the school. And so one of them wrote him a note, and the note was threatening that he was going to kill him. So let's call the principal John. I'm not, I'm not sure what his real name was, but we'll just say that his name was John. John got this letter from the student saying that he was going to be murdered because he stopped the drugs. And he had within him a fear, and it eventually cost him the job. It eventually cost him his two daughters who he was close to because they had to back off. He had to quit his job, and he started saving things hoarding things. For him, the problem was it was a protection. You, they can't get to me if there's a barrier. What's the barrier? The things that I own. And it went on and on and on. His two daughters tried to help him. 
He would no longer allow them to help him. He would just get angry if they tried anything to help him. And he was building up all of this hoarding behavior. His house was filled with stuff, and it wasn't good stuff. Some of it was broken, some of it was old, some of it was non-usable because it wasn't in sync with today's technology. It just was awful stuff. And instead of getting rid of it, he hung on to it. It was like a treasured possession, all of it. And if you went from one room to another room, you had to walk on top of all of the junk, empty bottles, empty bags, some boxes not even open, to get to another room. They, after a while, there's no even pathway to go from one room to another. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. And somebody asked him, what do you suppose is the problem? And he had a comment. He says, I fear the terrors of the night. Now, after a number of years of this, when he practically lost everything, he got a hold of, or somebody did it for him, a therapist to try to get him off from that problem that he had. And she was brilliant. She had absolutely did a wonderful job. And I watched the rest of the show because I wanted to see how she did it. What she needed to do and what she did so well to show him that what he was afraid of to begin with had no power anymore. It was gone. It had no power. So she gave him therapy and she gave him therapy and the time came that she wanted him to go back to the school where he was. And that filled him with dread and with terror and he was crying about it, but he needed to do that and he knew he needed to do that. She worked with the police department. She got a copy of the note which that student threatened him with, that he was going to kill him. And so he got into the school department, and all the rooms were empty. This was all prearranged. The, the rooms were empty, and she says to him, look, it's just an empty room. It doesn't have any power over you. It's an empty room, except for some chairs and some desks and some books and things you would expect to have in a classroom, a board, you know. But that's all it was. There's nobody here but you and me. None of these things are going to hurt you in any way. Absolutely none of them. Now what she had done is she had taken a copy of that note that the student had written to him and put it in the top drawer of the desk. And she says, you know, I know where that note is. I have a copy of that note. I've read that note. And it's in the top drawer of your desk. And he, she wanted him to take it out. And he was resistant to that because it caused him so much pain, so much pain. And he was crying about it and sobbing, and she simply put his hand on his shoulder, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. Let's take the, the letter out of the drawer. Well, he went and he take, took the note out of the drawer and he says, I can't read it. And, I said, and she said, I don't want you to read it. You don't have to read that. And she took the paper up and she looked at it and she had him sit down. She says, look, it's a paper with some words on it. That's all it is, just a piece of paper with some words on it. And you have lost so many years of the life that you wanted and that you loved because of a piece of paper with words on it. She didn't read the note to him. She gave him the paper. You don't have to read it. I don't want you to read it. I think the danger would have been it would have brought up all those fears all over again that he had compensated for with the hoarding. So what he did, what he eventually did, he ripped it up and he tossed the note away, put it in the garbage, Get rid of it. It has no power over you. That letter, you lost your life over a letter that was just simply a piece of paper. And you don't have to put up with that anymore. It has no power over you. And so therefore, with that done, and that was an incredibly important piece of the picture, and then they walked out of the building and with her help, he was able to get his house all cleaned up all the junk gone, and he had called his daughters, who had been away from him for a while, and invited them over for dinner. And they came really kind of uh, nervous what they were going to see. Was it going to be the same old thing? And they walked into this perfectly 
clean, rearranged house, perfectly normal, everything in its right place, no trash anywhere, just a really nice house, really cleaned up and very orderly. They were so pleased they couldn't believe it. And he was so pleased he had his children back. And he had made dinner for them, and they commented that this is the way life should be. We should be able to come over here as a family and have dinner together. And they accomplished that with the help of some really excellent therapy and, and his desire to get better. He had to have a desire to get better, and it was difficult. A lot of people think that therapy is so easy. You're talking with a person. Well, I can tell you that good therapy is hard work. It's really hard work. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to mess it up. I know I've had people ask to become therapists to ther you do therapy with me, and I always refuse because, one, they don't know what I want to do. I have plans for the, for the people that I've see, because I'm retired now, so I don't do it anymore, but I have plans for them step by step by step. How can I get them well again? And unless you know those plans and work with them and you're trained to work with them so that you know what you're doing, you're not going to help, but you're going to hinder. But this person, this female therapist was brilliant. He recovered. And so even though he might not get back to teaching because years had passed, but at the same time, he's no longer stuck there. The thing to remember is that when you have a problem, you don't have to stay stuck there. And if you have a problem and you need to get help, you should get the help. Now, this is a true story. What I mentioned is a true story. And this true story is, is kind of like a, a beck and call. A people who need help, that, and I've said before so many times, and I'll probably say it again a hundred times before the segment is over with, before the stretch of segments is over with, there's no such thing as a symptom without a cause. If you're having symptoms, there's a reason for it. You need to find out what that reason is. And I'm not saying you have to remember everything. I know analysts want you to remember as much as you can, and psychoanalysis is known for that. But I don't think that's necessary. I think you have to know a pattern of things. You know, what happened? And, and is it typical of other things that have happened? Not that you have to remember every incident, but that you have to remember enough so you can display a pattern of things and then you're well on your way. And it's not going to cure you just to know something, but it is a valuable, very valuable first step. Once that is accomplished, then you can work on other methods and the methods that therapists use. There are many of them to help you to heal from the problem. So this is just one example. And starting in the next segment, I'm going to tell you about another a segment of a person who a third of his life was destroyed because of fear that could have been managed and he wouldn't have had to have lost all that amount, uh, all that type of, of help that he could have had that he didn't have and it resulted in him being in hiding, in hiding basically for over 30 years because he was afraid. And the fear was useless and unfounded. So you need to get the help that you need when you need it. And I hope this is kind of a clarion call for those of you who do need help to get the help that's available to you. There's nothing wrong with getting help if you need it. There's nothing wrong with needing help. Our brains can only do so much. And when it can't do any more, then it needs help then it needs help. So I am going to, since I'm almost out of time, I'm going to close it here, and we'll continue with this next time. Please join me then.